Oh, hey! As you might have heard, Donald Trump's running mate and future star of his own Dateline episode, J.D. Vance, is ruffling quite a few feathers this week. We're effectively run in this country by a bunch of childless cat ladies who look at Kamala Harris. The entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. Listen up, you wingnut elegy. This country is still controlled by men in systems that were set up by men that are carefully crafted to continue to benefit men. So to put it in women-hating terms, you'll understand you're being hysterical. But let's be clear, there's no correlation between childless people and the presidency. For example, our very first United States president, Mr. George Washington, didn't have children. In fact, he had two stepchildren. That's right, just like someone else I know. And to your point about Kamala not being fit because she's not a mother, I'd like to remind you that no president in the history of the United States has ever been a mother. But maybe if she had five kids with three different men and a scandalous affair with a porn star and was convicted felon, that would be more palatable to Republican men. I mean, my God, are we tired. You sad, diet, Mountain Dew, drinking, couch humping, dolphin porn aficionado, all of us childless cat and dog ladies are going to go from childless and crushing it to childless and crushing you in November. And before you tell me he didn't really fuck a couch, spare me. I grew up in New Jersey in the 80s where everyone had a couch in their basement and I know a couch fucker when I see one. Totally unbelievable. That's, you're thinking, what's he on about now? So many people who work in, shall we call it, news media, professional broadcasting, journalism. Yeah, never was a word being so exaggerated as that particular description. Uh, can't read the room. They really, really can't read the room. Right now, there is a really big growing momentum towards um, Kamala Harris. Simple as that. But a lot of people are just like, they're playing the same old notebook. Let's uh, try and echo what Trump says. Let's smear her. Uh, let's bring on a talking head who's uh, anti uh, the Democrat Party. Yada, 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 yada. It's not working. The appears more than people like that who just, well, they're professional clickbaiters. Uh, they can throw as much. Uh, the best example probably is this clip I show you from um, Fox News have a media uh, program with a uh, uh, with Howard Kurt and uh, well it just exploded that's the only way of describing it because they do not know this is the bottom line they don't know how to deal with the growing momentum and I tell you why they don't know is because it's always the talking heads never somebody who's actually knocking on doors on the ground talking to real voters who have real issues that's why the momentum is being driven not by Fox News and their people. Have, people are tired of it. Enough. But with respect to Netanyahu, uh, you know, she she chose to miss the speech. She chose to meet with him personally and to lead the messaging from the White House on these issues. It shows she's got an embrace of the facts. She's taken a an embrace of the tack. facts. She's really because she's really connect. I'll just finish, Ben. One, just one, just one statement. Um, so uh, she ha she has a command of the fact she's connected with voters on the Palestinian issue, working to get humanitarian aid. Yeah, she's connected with those suffering. voters who are and burning the American flag in front of the Union oh, Station. Sweet I'm sorry, that's Heaven just gross. Ben. Hold it, hold it, hold it. That's ridiculous. I got to Oh, God. Are you serious? Are you serious? Honestly, you got to control yourself, man. She did that because she wanted to. She wanted to embrace the people who were burning the American. I have to, I have to uh, qualify that because she also put out a statement. Yeah, a garbage the, statement. Just listen. Dangerous, hate-fueled rhetoric and unpatriotic protesters. For those who took spray paint, a couple of blocks from here at Union Station. But I got to get a break. You guys calm down. What Up is next. the proper name that I meant to refer to flimsy Graham as? Is there a proper name? Well, because, look, let me give you the comparison of two people. Pete Buttigieg gets a lot of flack you got that word, but always rises above it. And for me, is just he's just one of the best politicians around. He's somebody I would put forward as potentially a, a VP. Whereas Lindsey Graham is just weak. That's the only word you can think of. Weak, weak, weak. And it was interesting. He was asked on uh, Face the Nation on CBS today uh, about J.D. Vance's pathetic comments to do with the fact that uh, anyone who doesn't have children, if they're single or if they're you know, married without a child, uh, well, it's just really derogative and nasty. You would think Lindsey Graham would have a little bit, just amongst all that, whatever it is inside his head, shite, uh, would be able to put construct something which would come out with a plausible reaction 
Nope. Guy. But it's not just Democrats, Senator. Let me show you something from the Wall Street Journal editorial yeah. page. We know you read that. They said Senator Vance's recent comments smack of smart Alec cracks that get laughs in certain right wing male precincts, but it doesn't play well with millions of female voters, many of them Republicans. We're talking about Senator Vance talking about childless Americans in political leadership in recent days, among other controversial comments. You're close to former President Trump. Does he in any way regret having Vance on the ticket? Uh, no, not at all, because J.D. Vance has one of the most compelling stories in American politics. When you look at his background, what he overcome early in life to be who he is, he went to Iraq. He didn't have to. He went to Yale Law, Law School. He became a Marine. That's no small deal. The American First agenda will be in good hands with J.D. No matter who the Democrats pick, uh, Vice President Harris picks to be her running mate, they will buy into her agenda. And her agenda is the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. She is the most liberal senator in the United States Senate. And there's been enough drugs on her watch as borders are fentanyl to come in through the border to kill everybody in the world. So the America described by Senator Schumer, where Biden did a great job, is not connecting with the American people. We're on the wrong track. The American people know it. And J.D. Vance will help President Trump get us on the right track. And if you expect Kamala Harris, the border czar, that's been a miserable failure on that issue, to get us back on the right track, it would be a colossal mistake. So we're in good shape on the Republican side. Policy matters as an election. If this is a policy election, Sen we win. Senator. Understand your focus on Vice President Harris, the presumptive Democratic nominee, but there are many Americans who do not have children. You're also not just a senator, you're a political strategist. You work informally with former President yeah. Trump and so many Republicans. You have a political yeah. mind. Is it a mistake yeah. for Senator Vance to keep talking about Americans who don't have children yeah. when it comes to a yeah. national well, campaign? Right, right. Yeah, I don't have children, but I'm going to vote for J.D. and Trump because I think we'll be safer and more prosperous and more secure. I want to end the Biden-Harris debacle. No, you should never say anything to hurt anybody's feelings. But when you look at all these interviews by J.D., it was talking about how the Democratic Party has abandoned the traditional family. This election is going to be decided by the American people on who can correct the problems in their lives. And here's what most Americans are experiencing having to choose between buying food and gas, a border that is beyond broken, the largest uh, cause of death of young people in America is fentanyl poisoning coming through the broken border and a world on fire. So this idea of trying to marginalize J.D. and make him some kind of bad person is not going to work because he's not a bad person. He's a good person. Senator he has served his country honorably and it's going to help President Trump win. Senator, no one's questioning his character here. We're just wondering, is it smart politics? They're not. Well, They're not. Well, not here at no, Face the Nation. The, yeah. Is it smart uh, politics for him to... <laughs> is, is he, uh, does he have the right message to win this election or not? Or would you advise him to adjust his message? His message is, I'm going to help President Trump change America. We're going to secure our border. We're going to drill for oil and gas that we own, and we're going to set the world right pretty quickly. We're going to address inflation in a real way. Uh, that's the message of the Trump Vance campaign is to fundamentally change the problems that you're living with. If you expect Vice President Harris to change the course we're on as a nation, you're going to be sadly disappointed. She is the most liberal senator in the United States Senate. There is no liberal horse that she has chosen not to ride. She sponsored the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. At the end of the day, recasting her is something she's not. She's a nice person, but she's incredibly liberal. I mean, major league liberal at a time when we need to reset America, she's going to double down on wrong policy choices. And J.D. Vance and Donald Trump are going to change the course of this country and the world. Senator, President Biden's going to be in Austin, Texas tomorrow at the LBJ Library, expected to talk about reforming the Supreme Court, pushing forward a code of ethics for the Supreme Court. You just heard the yeah. majority leader endorse that idea. Where do you stand? Could yeah. you work with President Biden, yes or no, on a Supreme Court reform package this year? 
No, because he wants to destroy the court. They want to pack the court. They want to undercut the conservative court. They've tried to marginalize the court, destroy the Roberts court. The Roberts court has brought constitutional balance back to the court, and the liberals in this country want to pack the court. They want to destroy the court. So their initiatives coming from Biden will be dead on arrival in the Senate. They have no desire to make the court better. They're just trying to make it more liberal. What about term limits for Supreme Court justices? Put aside the issue of packing or adding no, justices. No, 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 no. It's worth, well, they didn't complain about any of this when the court was pumping out opinions they liked. Only when we brought constitutional balance back from having a conservative court was the court a threat to the country. What's been a threat to the country is an out-of-control liberal court uh, issuing uh, opinions that basically take over every phase of American life uh, based on nine people's judgment. So this Roberts Court has brought constitutional balance back to the country, and one of the issues on the ballot in 2024 is what kind of court do you want? If you left it up to Elizabeth Warren to pick the court, you'd have the most liberal court in the history of the world, and Kamala Harris would be right there with her. Senator, in four I years, you won't have to vote again. I mean, he's made similar statements before. Uh, for, Governor Kristen Nuna was on after you on Fox News this morning. He said it's just classic Trumpism. I think it's pretty important to call out. What did you think when you heard him say that? Yeah, I mean, candidly, I don't completely understand what he means. I don't want to have to worry about what he means. It's yet another reason why we've got to make sure he doesn't get reelected. You know, I remember a few years ago, uh, there were some commentators who sounded clever by saying, you know, the problem with Democrats is we were taking Trump literally when mm. we should have taken him seriously, and the smart people were taking him seriously instead of taking him literally. But when he says something like that, or when he says something like uh, wanting a, a political opponent like Liz Cheney, a congresswoman who criticized him, mm. to be tried in a televised military tribunal, I don't know whether to take that literally or seriously. Either way, it's bad news. Either way, if he's saying, I want to eliminate a system so nobody has to vote again, that's a huge problem, and we should take that both of those of those ways. So let me ask you, and this is the awkward question you've been answering a million times, I'm not going to ask you to tell me the status of the vetting process or whether you're going to be the vice president. I do want to know, because you've run for president yourself, you know Kamala Harris, you know Joe Biden, you've been around the system, what kind of qualities do you think would best complement her? I mean, the bottom line is it's her call and she knows what she's doing. But what's great about this moment is there's an extraordinary bench of leaders in the Democratic Party, all of whom are doing everything we can to support the top of our ticket in Kamala Harris. And who knows what the exact flying formation is going to be like. But however that shakes out, I think you're going to see a lot of people pulling in the same direction in a party that, let's face it, is not always known for being extremely quick to get into alignment, mm. to, to fall in line, as, as they say. Say, but but what, part of what's been remarkable about the last week, and I, I still can't believe that it's only been a week, is how quickly she coalesced mm -hmm. our famously big tent party across all of its different uh, corners to come together and rally to the cause of making sure she's the next president. No question. I also think this process of having so many Democrats out is joyful. It's it is. What, what reminds people of how a lot of people get into politics for good reason. So regardless of what happens, I know a lot of Democrats, people who watched you on Fox News this morning, would love to see you on the debate stage with J.D. Vance. There's no question about it. You've watched him. You've commented on him. What, what would you love to, to debate him about? What, what topics would you love to discuss I mean, with him. Where do you start? I, I think, uh, you know, they've selected somebody who has really reminded so many Americans of why they are off put by the turn that the Republican Party has taken in the last few years. It's not just that he said a lot of things that are weird or, or insulting, like the, the characterization of, uh, you know, the Democratic Party as childless cat ladies. Uh, it's also that he seems to view everything in terms of the negative. And what I mean by that is, uh, for example, uh, th this thing about having children, it, I think a lot of us who have had kids would, would be certainly say that that experience uh, opens you to a new way of thinking about the world. But he doesn't talk about it in those terms. He talks about how anybody who doesn't have mm. kids is less than, that their perspectives have less value, which is just a really strange take. And it's not just a, 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 a weird style that he brings. It's that this leads to weird policies, like his proposal that the number of votes you get in an election would be different 
depending on how many kids you have. I mean, I mean, I would think one person, one vote is a pretty basic, universally accepted principle in this country. Uh, but there, there are so many strange policy commitments he has. And so I guess what I would most want to see in that debate, whoever is uh, at the table with him, is getting into that relationship between a strange worldview mm -hmm. and a strange set of policies. Let's also remember his relationship to Project 2025. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's kind of amazing they put all this stuff out there. Yeah, that's remarkable. I think it's also telling that this is the first time I can remember that a comprehensive policy framework for a political party has been so profoundly unpopular that uh, the president, the candidate of that party, has to pretend he's got nothing to do with it. Uh, let's face it, it is definitely the roadmap for a future Trump administration. Uh, J.D. Vance, having him on the ticket, basically certifies that fact because J.D. Vance wrote the foreword to the forthcoming book by the Heritage Foundation president. The Heritage Foundation is the institutional home of Project 2025, which means it's basically Project 2025, the book. So it couldn't be more on the nose <laughs> in terms of revealing uh, where uh, a Trump presidency would take this country, and as Kamala Harris says so effectively, where it would take us is backward. Mm, yeah, I mean, and the head of the Heritage Foundation was tickled pink, had a smile across his face when J.D. Vance was named. So let me ask you about messaging, because yeah. you're a deeply substantive, I mean, nerdy in the best way possible guy, but you're also very good at speaking an accessible language. And I think you, you just mentioned strange, weird. We've seen um, men, Tim Walls, the, the vice president, others use weird. This has kind of been an evolution a little bit in messaging over the past week, which I think is good and effective. Why do you think speaking about Trump Trump and Vance and the threat, and, and th that language works. Well, I, I think because it demonstrates that this is not just a traditional Democrats versus Republicans uh, debate or argument. We could uh, go back and forth all day on a, a more progressive worldview versus a more conservative worldview, but uh, the stuff that you're seeing out of Trump and Vance isn't just conservative. In fact, sometimes it's uh, as offensive to conservative ideas as it is to liberal ideas. This talk about terminating the Constitution, the, the deep weirdness of having somebody who wants to be president of the United States rambling about electrocuting sharks and, and Hannibal Lecter. And, and I think it reminds us of, of just the, the choice we face, not just in terms of policies, direction for the country, which is hugely important, of mm -hmm. course, but also a choice in terms of what it's going to feel like to live in this country. Uh, I don't want to worry about sharks that often or think about <laughs> Hannibal Lecter Poor too sharks. often or any of the just kind of dark and twisted things that were uh, kind of shoved in our face mm -hmm. all of the time during the Trump presidency and ever since by the Trump campaign. And I think we have a chance to have just a, a better, brighter future. That's what I love about this contrast. Look, don't get me wrong. We all know what we're up against and the gravity of what would happen to our democracy as well as our economy if there was a chance for Trump to return to power. But this isn't just about what we're trying to block. Mm -hmm. It's about what we're working to build. And I think that energy is part of what's been uh, so remarkable and so central in these recent days on the campaign trail. Yeah, unquestionably. Politics should be joyful. I think it's so important. You've agreed to stick with me for a few more minutes. I hope that still works for your schedule. We're going to sneak in a quick break and we'll be right back.